pools, collaboration between staff, and there's so many opportunities. It's practically endless. And we'll go through and we'll give you lots of suggestions for those as we cover the session. The thing that I emphasized last time, and I just want to raise it again, is that you are able to get G Suite across most devices. So it doesn't matter whether you're using an Android phone, an Apple phone, an old Windows phone, whether you've got a Windows laptop, an Apple Mac computer, or a Chromebook. You can either use it in the web browser, and that's the beauty of everything Google, it's accessible on all platforms, or you might be able to download specific apps. So I can see from people on the call, some people are obviously using the Meet app on their phone or on their tablet because it shows me that you're accessing the call via that. Martin, I can't see your screen. You can't, okay, that's interesting. I think, because we did see some other screens a minute ago. Okay, hold on a minute, I'll reshare. Yeah, no, I can see Julie's screen now. Sorry, that's nice. Okay. Yeah, I think that's you. That should yeah. be me. Yes, yeah, I see you now. Okay, I'll quickly run through that again. Uh, so, as far as as far as today's session is concerned, we'll recap everything from the previous session. This is part two of two. Part one was more around the structuring the users, enrolling people into Teams, and the different functions in Teams. Uh, sorry, Google Classroom. So today in Google Classroom, we are going to focus on using the features in Classroom to set distance learning, or also to work between staff as well. Although other apps in the G Suite will lend themselves to working between staff. So something we'll look at next week, will we have a session on Google Meet, which is what we're using now, and then how to use the additional features in Google Meets and Hangout Meets to enable collaboration between staff, maybe still having staff meetings and so forth, or you can use it for educational purposes or pastoral purposes. As I've just said, uh, you couldn't see the presentation, but it's, it's available across any device. Either you download the app on the relevant device or you open it up as a tab in the web browser, whichever one you do, it will be absolutely fine and work. The one thing you might find if you're working from home during this whole distance learning and isolation period is you're really going to try the quality of your broadband. So if you know that you've still got what's called an old type of broadband where it's not fiber optic, often the download speeds can be reasonable, but it depends how far you are from the exchange, but the upload speeds are not so great. So when you start to use G Suite heavily, you'll find that the need for a good quality broadband connection at home comes in, particularly with upload speeds and uploading documents. It's not impossible to upload your documents, but you might find it slower than you wish it to be at school. Something I want to also point you to that's really key is teach from home. We covered this briefly during session one. Google had this amazing resource called Teach From Home. It's got links to introductions, uh, webinars, guides to how to get started in most of the Google apps. And you can also download it in various different languages. So if you've got pupils that maybe are struggling and their parents need to support them, and you know that EAL is an issue there, you can download it already in a range of languages. And each day, Google are adding more languages to that. So there's a good helping tool there for teachers and schools to be able to say, look, if you've got a parent who's saying they can't get their child into the resources that you've set in Google Classroom, go to teach from home. It's not just good for them, it's also good for you as a teacher because it's got all of the guides and the, and the webinars from Google to support you in setting up a Google Classroom and how to use some of those more complicated features if you've already covered the basics. So in Google Classroom, we covered last time making a classroom and how that is the hub for the work that you want to set online. We started to look at assignments, but we're going to really focus on that in greater detail today. And we're going to look at how to increase with pupils and students on the stream page, but also with staff too. Supporting them in the classroom, we're going to look at how to get those students on. So last time we talked about using sync tools. Sync tools are where if you've got an MIS system in your school, such as RM Integris or maybe Capita Sims, if this was an ideal situation and we weren't all self-isolating at home, uh, you would have some more time to roll this out. One of the things that you would have to do, and we had some questions about this after last time session, is you're going to have to add the individual students or pupils yourself. 
And in a situation where you had more time to plan this, you would just link it with your MIS system. So then all of the pupil accounts would get created and then they would get organized into the classes for your school. Whether you're a single form entry primary school and for year group, or whether you're a secondary school and you've got sets or multiple sets of subjects, it's a little bit of extra work if you're having to do this yourself. Um, if you need to see that, we are in the process of re-recording the video from session one. So one thing I wanted to emphasize with all of these, Ellie can send you links to any of the previous sessions. So if you miss something or you just want to watch it again to make sense of it, you can do those on the videos we've got recorded. Uh, also, it's good for students because they may not have a computer at home or there's also a, a bustle around getting access to the one device they have in the house. So if they happen to have a tablet as well as a computer, it's something they could use to go onto the tablet device. For the rest of today's session, I'm just going to jump out of the presentation before I really launch into how to use assignments and what it looks like. Did anyone have any questions? Either you weren't in on the first session or you were on the first session, there was something you're still not clear about. If you unmute your mics, I'm quite happy to try and answer some of those questions now. No? Okay. If everyone could just remute their mics again. So when you go to Google Classroom, for those of you that aren't familiar, when you arrive in G Suite, let's say you've arrived on your calendar page, you might be in your Gmail, up here in the corner is the app launcher. Depending on how you've arranged your apps, you can drag and drop these around to get your most used apps at the top. So it's easy and you don't have to keep scrolling up and down. Down here is what's called more apps. So it shows you the other apps you've got available to you, but you'd find classroom down the bottom there. You need to click on classroom and then classroom up in another tab. And depending on what you've done, you're either going to see a blank space here or you're going to see some previous classes. You may have even tried putting in a test classroom. So it's going to be there. It becomes quite cluttered quite quickly if everyone in the school starts just adding classes or adding sets as a free for all. So it would be a good idea to use something like Google Meet as we are now to have a discussion between the staff and the school and plan just how exactly you're going to structure your different classes. It's going to be quite diverse and unique depending on what phase you teach and also how you then staff your school as well. So that's something that will pay dividends instead of just rushing in and everyone doing their own thing. And you end up with a big clutter of classrooms all set up in different ways. And it, it can be hard to look at from an overview from the staff side, so bad from a student side. So if you were looking at this from a pupil side, although I can see two classrooms, here's the pupil view. So they've logged into their Google Classroom. They just they're enrolled into, and in a primary school, they probably only would have one classroom. In a secondary school, you might have different subjects across here, so they were, might have six or nine thumbnails, but you want to keep as low as you can as far as the number of different classrooms they're going to be joining. If I pop back to the teacher view here, if I went into my primary classrooms, so I've just got a demi, demo primary classroom set up. You either enroll the students so this is just a bit of a flashback last time you either enroll the students manually one by one here or you can do it at the point of setting up the classroom so you press the plus you take type the name of the student so I've got a colleague that works for me called Daryl if he was a, a student or a pupil I could just bring him in there and then once they're joined in they appear down the bottom so you can see we've got a lot of uh, ex dead rock stars there as my pupils also you can add teachers so you'll be the owner of the classroom if you set it up you could add other people in. So Daryl there is acting maybe as the head of the school, or maybe you're on a job share, so you also need to be in, because often people would like to see what's going in and on in other people's classrooms as well at the same time. So that's just a little bit to recap adding people into classrooms. What most likely they're gonna land upon is Stream. So when you come in as a pupil, or you come in as a member of staff, you come into Stream. Stream is exactly as it says, it's the conscious, stream of everything that's been going on inside the classroom it might be posting of assignments in classwork it could be comments that you're going to put on up here at the top in stream you click the new button up there you choose the class you're going to assign it to so i've got distance learning in primary you can tick multiples so instead of having to go out and dip into each class you can put it in once if you've divided up your students 
you can then pick either all students you could when you set this up as groups in the admin center in google you can have things like year one year two or you could have english maths and science so that you get a message going out to all the students in a particular subject in the secondary school or once those students are active you can send to individual students you just tick and untick as you see fit and then you send the message out so it might be welcome to friday uh, what did you do yesterday? Because it's really important that you also enforce the pastoral element of this, and you want pupils to still talk to you to get a feel for what they're up to, whether it's been educational based, whether they've had some wonderful experience at home because their parents maybe have got a job and they've joined them in doing something in their role, or they've been making something in the back garden, maybe they've been outside uh, using nature around them. So getting that integration, also making sure they don't feel isolated. Something that I really want to emphasize on these distance learning sessions is that building that strength of community and whether it's strength of community between you as staff members still feeling that you've got a platform to go to and talk to each other. And Google Meet is probably the best for having those discussions. But also in classroom, you will see what your colleagues are saying and doing with their classes. And although you're not with them and you're not walking into their room, it's a really good way of just keeping in touch. And the same goes for the pupils and also getting the parents to buy into that at home. They can see that there's this community spirit and they can then talk to each other as pupils. Often you get asked, oh, well, I've got great concerns about my son or daughter being able to post in here and talk to each other. Is it moderated and what do we do if things are going wrong? Well, here you go. So David did make a comment to me on the 24th of March to a question I asked there. So if I'm worried about that, I can reply to them directly there, but I could tap on the side and either can delete that from view and it means it disappears from the view of all of the other participants in this classroom. But I could also mute David until I've had a chance to talk to him about the error of his ways and explain why he posted something that might, might not have been appropriate and try and get them back on board. Instead of isolating them, which is what we want to avoid in this distance learning situation, we want them to still be involved and still be part of that discussion, and still be part of the community. So. It may be that you give them time out for a set period, but you try and reintegrate them as soon as possible. There may be some difficult to reach characters and you just have to leave them muted and out of the class discussion permanently. But it's important that you find ways to engage with them in other methods. And that could be using uh, Google Meets or it could be That's using it. other platforms at the same time. Yes, yes, yes. Still got their mic on. Whoever's still got their mic on, would you mind muting it? It would just help with uh, everyone else on the call. That something is really important and you want to make sure it's at the top of the stream because you can see this quite quickly becomes a long long stream of events you might want to bring something up so i might decide that down here i set the maths work i can move it to the top so if i click move to top all of a sudden the maths work will come back up here and it's the first thing they see because i want to remind them the due date for it is today and therefore it's at the top of their conscious stream when they come back in so really it's just a recap of stream and answer some of the questions that came from last session if anyone got any questions about stream because i won't really be coming back to it if you unmute your mics and ask now i'm more than happy to try and answer any questions i'm also quickly going to go over to the pupil view and that's the view i'm in now this is how that stream appears to a pupil so it's very similar they just don't have the admin options of moving posts around in streams they can but they couldn't delete things does anyone have any stream questions at this point? Okay, I'll continue. The next tab I'm going to focus on is classwork. So I am now back in the teacher view, not the pupil or student view. As far as the classwork view for students, we'll look at it after we've gone through how to set the classwork in here. So you can see I've begun to set different types of classwork. Up here at the top, the create button is the main thing that you're going to use to set your classwork. You can link out to events in Google Calendar. You can also pull documents in from your Google Drive. So your Google Drive is like your USB stick or external hard drive you used to use when you stored your files. It's stored on Google servers. It's in the cloud, but you have it as your personal storage area. If any of you have access to that, just off of the app launcher here you click google drive and then when you arrive at google drive there you'll see folders or you'll see individual documents and you can organize your files just like you would with your server in school or your computer that you use personally if we go to create 
what we'll do is we'll quickly look at how to create each type of these contents that go on here. So they're called posts. We'll start with an assignment because more often than not, an assignment is what you're going to want to do. You'll get these little pop-ups if they haven't been disabled because they're there to prompt you and help you through. So I'm going to call this, uh, let's call this coding. And we're going to say scratch. Instruction, so we're going to say use scratch line to practice the block-based coding last term and create a musical instrument at this point we've got options about how we choose this to be sent out to the people so a we can choose if it just goes out to the classroom we're currently in or if we want to push this out across a couple of classrooms so if you're a maybe a two, three, four entry primary school, and you know you've got some parallel year one uh, Google Classrooms, you could assign this all in one go and you wouldn't have to go back out again. You can choose, if you were in a three, four entry primary school, you might see the different versions of your class. So you might have year one oak, year one birch, year one maple, and you could then tick all three and it goes out to all of them at the same time, or you could limit it to this as students in one. It's up to you how you distribute it. You can choose points or whether it's unmarked. So if you want to go back afterwards and use the mark feature in Google Classroom, give it some point scores. Doesn't have to be out of 100, it could be out of anything. So if I'm expecting 20 blocks to be used in my coding, I might say it's out of 20 because I'm gonna give one point for each block that I see them using in their coding. Give them a due date. Uh, if you're setting this for homework, distance learning, or you might be saying it for the next day because you're going to kick this off in a Google Meet, but you expect them to hand it back in using Google Classroom the next day. So we're on Friday here. I think I'll set it for Monday the 30th. And then over here, I can link it to topics. So you can create topics. A bit like you've got during the day, you might have the different cards on the side of the board in the primary classroom to signpost them as to what they're going to be doing next. Is it going to be maths and English in the morning with a break in between? And maybe you're going to dip into something else before you hit lunch. You can add the topics or you can have no topic at all. So I'm going to create a topic here, computing. And then it will go into the computing topic. Let's go into the computing topic. Come off the bottom of my screen. I need to scroll up first. Okay, that's not playing ball. I will use one of the others I've got here. We'll pretend that um, computing is maths. And then down here, you can add a rubric. So those people that were on the Microsoft call yesterday, rubrics are ways of almost building your success criteria, but having them in Google Classroom. So we're using scoring that's on. The point scoring can be either ascending or descending, depending on which way you want to run it. So we're going to have the name of our title. So we're going to call this using block-based coding. Uh, you can give a description if you want. Points required, level title. So this might be, let's say, using, using root encoding. Description is loops encoding. All of this would have been covered by prior teaching, so you wouldn't just put this in cold. And for those of you that aren't, aren't uh, great lovers of teaching the computing curriculum, uh, it's, uh, it's something you can get to grips with there. So there goes the rubric for one, but unlike, for instance, Microsoft Teams, where it's all on one rubric, you have to build your rubrics individually, and then it explains what they can get each point for. But it's about transparency because you aren't necessarily there to describe if there's 20 points available, how do they get each of the 20 points? Well, you can put the rubrics in and they can click on them and they'll see them and they'll explain what they need to include in their coding in order to get the 20 points available. Then if we went to add, you can either bring things in that are stored in your Google Drive. You can link to a website. So I'm going to say link here. 
Uh, I'm going to go off up here and I'm going to go to scratch. Scratch three at the moment. We go into scratch. To save them arriving here and not knowing where they go, I'm going to take them into the create page, which is where you do your block based coding in scratch. Uh, again, as I said, it just depends on your broadband speed about how things load. There is the block based coding. So I'm just going to take that URL. I'm going to go back to the tab for classwork and I'm going to pop it in there. And I'm going to put add link because what I want to do is make this whole experience as seamless as possible for the pupils. I don't want them having to go off and do a search. I want it all contained in the assignment. I'm also going to add in a piece of work that's going to help them. So I'm going to add a file. So again, you can link to your Google Drive. It will look directly into it. So those are the folders in my Google Drive, and I can pick them up from there. But also look at shared drives. If your school is already a G Suite school, you can have shared drives. They're a bit like on a server, a whole school shared or teacher shared, but that's where you get shared documents for the school. My Google Drive is exactly what it says. It's your personal area. But I'm going to go today, upload from the computer, because a lot of people are going to be doing this when they're setting work. Select from your device. I'm going to go into Scratch folder. I'm going to choose this one here. I'm going to press Open. It brings it up. I can add more files if I wanted, so I could go in. I can add the example scratch coding file and put that in there too. So it will take uh, various file formats. It's not a problem. And then I press upload. And you see the upload bars is uploading to the internet. Earlier when I said about your broadband speed, an upload is always slower than download at home or usually slower than, unless you've got a really good fiber connection because you're in the middle of a town or a city. Uh, that upload might take a little chug, particularly if you're putting big PowerPoints up. And then they all appear down here as they're pinned underneath the work. When you're ready, you can assign it or you can schedule it for assignment. So if you want to get all of this already ahead of time, let's say you're at home, you've got children because we're all juggling several roles of teachers and educationalists. Uh, and you've got a quiet hour because the children are out with your partner. You might want to schedule all of these ahead of time. You can schedule them and then they will release to view at the time and date that you set. And they'll then become visible to the pupils or students. But I'm just going to assign it straight away here just so we can see it. It will assign. And then when it assigns, it will appear in our list. <coughs> it might take a minute or so for it to appear, but it, no, no, there it is. It's gone in the maths because I didn't give it a separate subject. If I'd called it computing, there would have been another title at the top here with computing. So that is a little bit confusing for this example. But in there is, uh, is coding. And then the pupils will see it in their pupil view. And we'll go back and look at how this appears to pupil view in a minute. If you decide, oh, no, I missed something, or that isn't quite how I wanted it to be, you can always go back to edit by pressing the dots on the side. Press edit. You're back into the view where you were before. And then it's all good because you've assigned it to your students. I've assigned it out to David Bowie. Maybe I decided I missed a student out. Whatever you need to change, it's in there. You just save it afterwards. It saves it for all of the people that are in that exercise and that assignment, and it's ready and available. The next thing that you could make is a quiz assignment. So in here, it links out to what's called Google Forms. Google Forms is like having a piece of paper with lots of questions on it, and then they answer the questions, but in the web browser. And when they answer the questions, the great thing about Google Forms is it records the answers of all of them individually. You can see all their responses. They can only see their responses and contributions. And you could use it to survey maybe how they got on with the work last week, or if you need to go back and set some additional uh, something in maths, because actually when they were doing grid multiplication, it didn't quite sit with them. So let's say we're going to call this learning check. Instructions, let me know how you got on last week's distance learning. You then create your, your Google form. We are going to run an entirely separate session on Google Forms in the coming week. So we'll, we'll cover how to use that for quizzes and also how to use it for questionnaires. So lots of uses. You can add one in if you've already got it created. Uh, you can have grade importing, which means it imports the grades on the side. These options here are pretty universal, so I'm not going to go through them every single time. What I covered on the first time applies, and then you just press assign. 
and I haven't given that topic this time, so we're going to give you an example of what it appears without any topic. So there it is at the top because there isn't a topic appearing for it to go underneath as a subheading. So it just appears at the top of the stream. The next set you can uh, put in is a question. So I did one of these earlier. So my question I've I've couched under PSHE. So I've asked them about how you how you've been helping today. So I'm going to go in and re-edit this one instead of creating it from scratch. So you can see you pose a question. That is my question. I've given a little bit more of a way of instructional description there. You can still add in any of the resources, whether it's from Google Drive, a link, a file, or a YouTube video, because maybe you want them to watch something. Maybe there's something pastorally wise that you the, I've seen some videos on things like CBBs where they've been describing what it feels like to have to self-isolate. So you might want them to empathize with others in what it feels like being in that situation. So you could pin the video in the bottom here so they can watch it and then they can respond to the question. I made my question short answer, but you can also have things like multiple choice as well. So you can almost take a poll from the question that you ask. So it could be, how are you feeling about it? And it could be good, not not great, or I'd like to speak to someone. You maybe use that as a pastoral intervention at the same time. So there's lots of ways that you can use the questions feature. It can be a single one or it can be multiple choice. I'm just going to resave that. And I've put that under PSHE because they'd be used to seeing that under PSHE. Go back to create. You can also use it for posting materials. That means learning materials. So if you need to get across materials that you would normally distribute in a classroom, maybe it's a worksheet that you would give out. It could be something from a textbook they'd normally access, or it's materials you want them to refer to on a website. It could be anything like that. That's how you get your materials into Google Classroom. So if I look down here, I think it was maths that I created on materials earlier. I know it wasn't, it was home learning resources. So if I go into home learning resources, I'm just going to edit the one I've already created. So all I would do is press materials. The little thumbnail on the side here just reminds you what you chose when you said that original create menu. I'm calling it home learning resources. What I want to make sure here is that in the distance learning scenario, that the pupils have got lots of support mechanisms. If they can't ask their peers in stream, or maybe their parents aren't able to help them, or you aren't on a particular Teams call through Google Meet at the time, uh, you would end up with them having resources that they can refer to. So I want them to go to BBC Bite Size, but I want them to be safe. E-safety is still important in this scenario, so I'm going to give them the shortcuts. There's the BBC Bite Size. In my school, we use my maths as a subscription, so I want them to go into my maths and do some exercises to the links there. I also buy in IXL. And when we were open, I used this for homeworks, but now I actually want to set some distance learning tasks on there as well. So you can use it as, as an enrichment beyond Google Classroom because it can get a bit stale if they're always coming to the same platform. So you might want them to branch out occasionally and use IXL, for instance, or do something in my maths. And down here, I've got my topic learning grid. Now I'm going to assign this to some students. Oh, I did assign it previously. That's good. I haven't got a topic. I'm going to create a topic. So let's say this is learning resources. And then I'm going to press save. So that's going to update it from earlier. So whereas it was just sat at the top where I've got a learning check, almost orphaned on its own because it didn't have a category to belong to, by going in and adding learning resources, it just helps to signpost it for the pupils. So it's not so bewildering when they come to look at it. I said that we would have a look from a pupil perspective. So if I switch over now, now I am on a pupil view. So it also tells them if they're working, they get these pop-ups. Your stream was updated. So something's new down there to go look at. So go and have a look about what's happening in your stream. Oh, okay, I can see a new piece of work's appeared. If you press show, it automatically jumps down to it uh, and it will bring it up to the top too. Classwork. You can have topic filters. So if you want to see all topics, you can leave that on, but you can use filters on the side to just see the things that you're interested in for maths. So if I click maths, it gets rid of all of the noise surrounding the other topics that have been posted in the classroom by my teacher. And now I've just got the important work for maths. I could also point out to my teacher if I want to be really clever. Uh, sorry, you've posted something in the maths topic that relates to coding. Can you go back, Mr. Long? Could you put it underneath coding? 
But if I want to bring it all back to all topics, I click all topics, and then I've got everything here. So from a pupil view, it's a lot more streamlined and clean. If I decide to go into my home learning resources, this is what I'm going to see as a pupil. I go in there. Here is the text. There are my links to click, which I will just branch out to if I click them. If I want to see the learning grid, it opens up inside my Google Classroom so I can see the preview. And here's what I'd want the pupils to be doing around the topic. So my topic for this term is mountains. And I want them to have a go at all of these different things. Use the IXL link I gave them, and I've directed them to specific activities on there. But there's lots of home learning activities there around a the topic we were studying at the point we had to close the school because of lovely COVID-19. I'm just going to pop back over to the teacher view. And I'm still on the classwork tab in the teacher view. So we've covered so far stream. We've covered how to use create and add different types of classwork. The other great thing about classwork, once you've created it, if you are working collaboratively and maybe you've got a multiple entry primary school or you've got a secondary where you've got not a lot of difference between maybe set two and three science, you can potentially reuse the posts. Or if one of you sets the work for one particular aspect of the topic, someone else can set the other one and then you can mix them between you and you can reuse it. People is what I covered earlier. That's where you add teachers and extra students. Marks are amazing. This is your virtual mark book. So when you set your classwork and you set your topics, it starts to build your mark book. And up here, you can have your whole class feedback or your whole class marks, which you can do all together, or you can do it individually. So if David has attempted the coding that I set him, I can click on that. And uh, maybe he's got everything except he hasn't used one type of coding box. So I'm going to make that 19 out of 20. And then on the side, I can return it to him. Uh, and I can return that even though he's not submitted the assignment. Maybe I had a discussion with him because on a, on a Google Meet, we discussed some intervention. Uh, and when it's handed in, it will change from not handed in. But you can also view the submission of the pupil. So you don't have to leave your Google Classroom view. You can go and see the work that they've submitted. So if you press submission, it will take you over to their piece of work. Now you're viewing it. And let's say David had been diligent and had handed in his coding work and he put in a file for Scratch. The file for Scratch would appear here and I could click on it. I could upload it into Scratch over here and then their coding would turn up and I could see the quality of the coding and I could maybe make some suggestions about how to improve further if I decide that in my primary classroom that there's some common flaws, just like you normally would, okay, so they're all not getting the loops function, I could maybe then schedule in Google Meet a lesson where we all had 20 minutes quickly, and we went through that, and I modeled it, and then they went back and they revisited the work that I'd set them in classwork over here, and they have a go at improving the quality of that original work. <coughs> For today's session, I'm not going to cover any more aspects. I appreciate just within classwork, the create and the different options and then how you organize them is the learning curve for many people initially. And I'd always advise you, log in as you as a teacher and maybe create for your school, just as I've done here, create some mock pupils and then have it so you can go and view what it looks like for stream as a pupil view what it looks like when you're looking at the classroom and how it comes across to them because it's really good to get that aspect of what it's like from the other side and it can end up being that you just concentrate on being a teacher and building the content and building the resources or building the opportunities to link with the pupils of the students and you can forget how it comes across to them on the other side i'm not going to talk any longer but i'm going to open it up to questions so if any of you want to unmute your mics and ask questions i'm happy to take them now uh, is there a chance you could go through how to archive um assignments that past their due date so they don't appear in the screen yeah no problem at all so if i go back into classroom <coughs> so if i go over to here uh, da, da, da. I need something that's gone past. It's due date. Hold on. Just, just to save time on this call, because I know I've got people stacking up questions, but essentially, 
if on my math symmetry it passed today's due date, so that's due in at four o'clock today, you can see from that description. You click the button on the side, you'll have another option here, which then says archive or hide from view. Uh -huh. So click that and it will take it away, but it's got to go past the date that is due to come in. Right. Great. Okay. Otherwise, you won't be able to do it, uh, and it will just sit there and annoy you, and it'll be really frustrating. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Any other questions? I'm just gonna have a sip of water or someone ask one. Yes. Can I ask? Um, how do you upload? How do the students upload their work? Okay. So if I go back over to the student view, so let's say I went to do my math symmetry work. And I've got the math symmetry sheet, and typically this is what you would get. <clears throat> Unless you're a Google school and all your documents are in Google Forms, yeah. in sheets and slides, you're very likely, particularly if you're getting resources off of pre-prepared websites, you're going to have them in Microsoft Word and PowerPoint. So they'll preview in here, but what the people will need to do is open them up on the computer, and then they submit them back in. So let's do that. So if I click up here... I'm going to open it up in a full window. I'm then going to download my resource. This is where it's easier if you convert them into into format into the Google format. You can do that. So as it's flagging here with this big funny donut that's popped out, you can try that. And this might be where you need to have a session where you just go through ahead of time of setting any work. One of the first things is boot camp for Google Classroom if your school's not used it before. Uh, in getting it done. So in here is the work that we've got. So welcome to office editing. That's great. I'm just going to hide the bar down the bottom there. If I might anyone say to work, to um, type in the top. Uh, I've locked the resource in this instance. Please let me edit. request or they could in their google drive take a copy so if they went to their google drive let me go to david bowie's google drive da -da -da. come out of that go over here to drive So I want to see, there's the lines of symmetry document, but I want to make a, uh, make a copy of it. Make a copy. So <clears throat> because that was my original one that I set from Classroom, it stops the pupils all over writing the original and ended up with this horrible mess. So if they create a copy, Get rid of that one. It's going to take his mail up. I might let that do his little thing. <clears throat> so you view the assignment down here. So this is where you add your work. So you add your work in here, and you can either link to it out of that document I've now got in my Google Drive, and it will link it in here, or you can link to a file if you've got it saved on your, uh, so you can link to a website if you want to save to like a file, maybe in Scratch, because you've got an account in Scratch, or you can link to a file on your computer if you just want to upload it and drag it in. It then appears in here, whichever method you've done, and you just press mark is done. And then as a teacher, you would get a notification that that student has turned their work in as they use in Google. Any more questions? Yeah, a uh, quick question. I, yeah. I just, I, I missed the beginning of this seminar. So can okay. I just check, how do you start all this? You, is it all accessible from Google Drive? Yeah, <clears throat> so there was a, there was a session that, prefix this where we had a discussion around how to create the classroom and how to organize and how to create students so okay. one of the things you'll need is you're going to need the appropriate level of access if i went back to my calendar for this 
Yeah. Are they going to need someone on IT admin or you're going to need someone on IT admin to give you access because you're going to need what's called the admin console here. And when you okay. go to the admin console, oh, it's going to verify it's me now. Thank you very much. <laughs> No pressure, you've got to try and remember my password. When you get to the admin console, what we give a lot of teachers is access to what's called dashboard users in groups. So you right. go to the users, you'd create your students and your staff in here individually, and then mm -hmm. back to the admin console, you then groups, and then you'd have a class teachers group. It's very niche to have students, but very likely in the primary, you might have students year one, students year two. It's up to you and your school as to how big it is, as to how you organize groups. And then you set the students to join the, the users to join the different student groups. And then you make those join the classroom, essentially. That's how it happens. So over here, that's why I've got these students who are enrolled. On this, this demo one, I've only got three students in here, but I've enrolled them into this classroom here. So basically, there's a there's a process that you need to go through to set all this up, and we need to yeah. speak to our IT to like, you know, people to to set it all up, basically. Yeah, there is. Unless you're really keen, or you don't have an IT department, I would hand that back off to the IT department. Or if you've got to turn it on as a as a consultant, you can also have turn it on help you with setting up too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any there's, other questions? Yeah, there's a couple of questions in the chat field, Martin. I know it Lovely. looks like there's 42, but there's not quite that many questions there. <laughs> okay, we'll scroll up until I get to the beginning of these questions. Uh, marketing, da, 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 yeah, let's just down a little bit from there, I think, just after, from about Julie. From Justina, I'm sorry. Justina is the first question, I think. I can't read. Oh, Justina, where are you? <laughs> You'll be up there somewhere. Yeah, from there. From here? Yeah, down to just below Claire. So she is. There you are, Justina. Uh, Restream. If you disable students, can post and comment in stream settings, does it mean that students won't be able to upload any of their work? No, uh, it doesn't affect the other. They they work independently of each other. So all you're doing is muting their ability to make inappropriate comments or contribute if you don't wish them to. They can still uh, they can still add comments to you one to one on uh, work that you set them, or they can still contribute to assignments. It won't stop them doing that. Next one, could you explain a little more about rubrics? Yeah, rubrics. So rubrics are meant to be bite-size help guides. So for, let's say, for our primary colleagues on this call, or it could be for secondaries, normally you go through and you say, okay, I'm looking at a, a four-point question on this exam paper here. To get these four points, we'll need to see, let's say it was maths, we'll need to see your working and in that working we'll need to see the steps you've gone through in order to get to the to the answer to the question, that's one point. There'll be another point if you've then got the correct answer, so that's that's another rubric. So the rubric is what each point is, what, what each point is how you get that point or how you are successful, like success criteria, in progressing in your learning and getting past that point and meeting that rubric requirement but also then what you might get in the way of a reward whether it's points or or some sort of time with the teacher or whatever else so rubrics are meant to be transparent guides to help pupils or students about what they need to do and how they might need to do it and why it's important in the bigger picture in being successful in their learning and still making progress and might be progress within a task in the in the assignment you set but it's going to be progress across the year in the bigger picture uh steve definitely want to know more about google forms please we will be doing that so we'll, we will advertise our google form session we'll go through how to use google forms that is one of the upcoming sessions i think now it's been pushed back out of next week and it will probably happen after easter but we are going to continue these sessions 
possible to pin posts to the top of the stream they are sticky do you know what i've not ever tried that let's have a look um into here so if i said for instance new assignment which i promoted earlier <clears throat> can't see a way i don't think i've ever found a way of pinning it i found a way it, you keep putting them back up and re-promoting but i've never seen ways of pinning them to the top the up running coming over here sort of negates the need for that a little bit because regardless of where these are here, if they've got something that's got a deadline and you know it's important that you want it in or you want a response from them, that acts like a mini diary on the side for that purpose. Uh, I've not seen a way of making sure it's pinned to the top like a sticky tab. Can we post videos? Yes, you can. So if you used Google Meet, and you pre-recorded something, or maybe you've got a video that you've got out of a YouTube channel somewhere that you're using for your school. Yes, you can add the videos in. So over in your classroom over here, if I went to classwork and I went to create and I made an assignment and I went to add, if I went to Google Drive, if I recorded something in Meet, what I will find is in my Google Drive, I've got a folder in here called meet recordings and then in here if i add that in there is my recording that i've recorded in meet and now it's in my assignment if you wanted to add that from an external video so maybe you've you've downloaded and you've got a youtube video that's an mp4 or some sort of video format you can just go to file and then you go select from your computer and then you find that file on your computer and you upload it that way so yeah it's perfectly fine to put videos in and i'd encourage that because it's so powerful to have the videos in there either as descriptions i know from personal experience of using this with my daughter who's nine and she's uh, in year four at primary school they've got an awful lot of instructional videos and they've had their peers also making instructional videos when someone's got stuck or they're setting in a various aspect of the learning they're creating their own and they're posting them for each other so there's lots of different ways of doing it I'm just gonna have to refresh this browser because it's had a hissy fit a minute nope it's not even gonna let me do that Let's see if i can swap browsers no nope. are you all able to still see my browser yeah yeah we can still see you martin ellie i might have to get you to read the rest of the questions for the purpose of this session I've, my computer's a lot and i know if i close this down i'm gonna lose you all no worries. So what was the last one you did? Was it David's last one? I've just yeah. done, can you put videos in? So that was the last question I covered. Okay. Sorry, I just had to answer the phone. Um, once the classroom is set up, I've invited pupils to join the classroom. Only six are confirmed. Do they have to join to get assignments? Yeah, they will, they will need to join in. Um, you can force that joining. And then <clears throat> the assignments, they, they, they work, they use i can't show you frustrating now but once they they engage in doing the assignments they'll start to appear so if you remember when i went across to my mark book earlier i could only see david but i'd assigned the same assignment or topic to another couple of pupils there those like so in for john lemon and freddie mercury but they hadn't engaged the assignment yet the minute they do they appear in my mark book there okay great thanks okay can i ask um, oh yeah can you do, can you make a copy for each child when you assign it rather than they have to make their version themselves to make it easy for them yes joe you can yes so when you go to add you then create your document and then on the left where it says students can view the yeah. drop down that then you can change it to make a copy for each student and then they can edit your work live on their screen and then resubmit it without having to download and upload anything else Perfect. That'll make yep. it easier for them. They're more likely to do it. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Um, and there's just one more question. Oh, the two is um, oh, one to be answered. Um, how to switch between teacher and pupil view? But obviously, you can't show because you're frozen. I can't show, but all I've done to achieve that when I've been building is I've logged in on one web browser <clears throat> as a student or a pupil, and I've logged in on the web browser I've been using with everyone on this call as a teacher uh, or you can open up what's called an in private session so you could probably see from my web browser towards the top right hand corner in a, in a funny sort of shape it says in private with some hatched lines through so if you do that it allows you to have 
two different types of users running without it contradicting each other. Otherwise, what will happen is you'll log in in the web browser as a teacher, and then when you try to log in as the pupil, it will kick you out as the teacher, and you'll end up going backwards and forwards. So if you want two running simultaneously, you'll need to use either what's called a Google incognito window, which is just like a separate private browsing window, or on the various other things that you've got in private and so forth, but you need to have those two different sessions running at the same time. You can pin them left and right on your way on if you're using Windows 10, or you can use different tabs if you're using a Chromebook. If you can, you can put it uh, set it up on your mobile phone so you can have the student on your mobile phone, and then they're completely separate devices. That's worked for me. Okay, I've never tried it on the mobile, but that's good to know. There's also a question, can you use Seesaw with Google Classroom? Do you know, I've got that as a question on one of my <clears throat> one of my schools have asked me this morning about that. I don't believe from any, any involvement I've had with Seesaw, and I haven't used it in a massive way, so if I've got any schools on here that do use Seesaw heavily, feel free to contribute. Um, I've not seen a way of integrating the two platforms. You can set, you can set links to Seesaw, Obviously, I've shown you how to set links, but I've never seen a way of bringing Seesaw work into Google Classroom itself. Any okay. questions? Yeah, um, there's, how do I tell if a pupil has sent private comment? At the moment, only no, because my emails tells me and I have to go in using the pupils tab. Is there an easier way? Yeah, so if you went to... Yeah. I showed you a few minutes ago to that Google admin console, you can set all of your notifications in there. So you can either enforce it for staff globally for your school. So they get notifications and they are, they're getting them as banners or they're getting them as pop-ups or they're getting them as emails. So you can set the level of notification that you receive, but you can set it individually yourself by going up to the gear and going to settings. And if your school have allowed it within your Google G Suite setup, you should be able to set your notifications in, in there too. That's everything that's in the chat now. Okay. Tim's just said, Tim has shared a link in there on how to use on CISO and Google Classroom. So that's <coughs> okay. I will add it to the list of comments. Okay. Any other people like to ask any questions? Hi, can I have a, ask a question, please? Of course you can. Um, I work with quite young children, and I'm. I, how, what would be the best way if they had for that symmetry example? If they printed out, and I'm trying to avoid giving them too much work because I'm aware that ink is quite, and it's a luxury maybe for some. Um, and they do their work. How would they then? upload their work would that have to be a photo they may not be able to scan yeah i think the easiest way is to get a parent if they're involved to photograph where i said hand in the file you could do it that way but right. if you are lucky and you've got a touch enabled device you could ink directly on top of the document right now these are the things i'm not sure that's really that's the okay so they'd have to print it out and then do the work take a photo Upload it. Yeah, it's probably the simplest way with younger children because then you could also have the parents sat next to them at the kitchen table uh, and then take a photo of it to, to evidence what they've achieved and then get that Brilliant. back to you as far as handing in is concerned. Super, thank you. No problem. Any other questions before we stop recording? There's nothing else in the chat. Okay. We'll end the recording now, but I'm happy to stay on the call. Unfortunately, due to the wonders of technology, my web browser's locked up. I can't demonstrate anything else to anyone, but I'm quite happy to take verbal questions. But Ellie, if we finish the recording at this point, and I'll wait for people to drift away. But if you do want to stay and ask anything, feel free to do so.